I'm Emily. I'm a mechanical engineer here at Lord Corporation. I manage our aerospace technical support requests, and I'm going to talk about the mechanics of the engine mounts and shimmy dampers today. So just to go over a brief description of what we'll cover in our presentation, we're going to talk about engine mounts, going over uh, the history of our mounts with Lord Corporation, some key terminology that I'll use throughout the presentation and that we also use here at Lord when we're talking about our engine mounts and shimmy dampers, main installation practices, the key technology and design of our mounts that we use when we're designing a mounting system, and lastly, the maintenance and inspections of our engine mounts. Next, I'll move on to talk about Lord shimmy dampers, talking about the design behind our shimmy dampers, We'll compare shimmy dampers of Lord versus hydraulic standard shimmy dampers. And lastly, we'll talk about the damper effectiveness of the Lord fluid free shimmy damper. Also, feel free to use the hashtag today, General Aviation, and we'll also be on Twitter with the at Lord Corporation tag. Lord mounts have been around for many years now. They date back to around the 1930s where they're featured in some of their first aircrafts. We teamed with companies like Curtis Wright, as shown in the image here, putting our mounts on these aircrafts, and we've only increased them through the years. An interesting part, though, is that a lot of the technology has just ultimately started from the same uh, design and just been evolved over time, and now we're in a large amount of applications throughout the whole general aviation community. So the first thing I want to discuss is why Last American engine mounts over the other options out there. One benefit with elastomeric mounts is we're able to optimize system responses. So with that, we can control the motion uh, of both the engine and the mounts using a wide variety of stiffnesses and configurations, and it gives us the option to focalize systems as well. We also achieve better vibration isolation through our elastomers and through altering uh, different properties of the elastomeric materials. Next, we can consider various applications and considerations which are specific to those applications, uh, going over things like fluid effects, tuning systems to certain frequencies, and lastly, there are very simplified solutions with few parts, and that allows them to be very easily installed in the applications. So going over how our mounts are packaged, there's one key kit number or one key assembly number for our mounts, Within that part number are three components. We have our two bonded mounting halves and our one spacer component. Our bonded mounting halves we refer to as sandwich mounting halves. I know in the industry they're often called biscuits or donuts or muffins, cupcakes, we've heard it all, but they're actually known as sandwich mounting halves because they are the rubber elastomeric mounting components of our engine mounting kits. Uh, each of these three components get their own part number, but they are defined under the overarching assembly part number, which is what you would order the kits within. So next we have our four spacer components that come within our mounting kit. First, we have the straight spacer. This is just a metal spacer used as a structural component within our mounting kit. Then we have our bicycle pedal spacers, which as you can see in the image to the right, resemble an actual bicycle pedal with elastomeric material wrapped around the metal component of the spacer. These can be oriented in different directions, which are allow for additional stiffness depending on that orientation. Then we have our bonded spacers, which have elastomeric material wrapped around the spacer itself. And lastly, we have our LM dampers, which are a unique type of spacer, which have a gummy feeling to them. We call them the gum spacer often. And they have additional damping during startup and shutdown of the aircraft. So to go into some further details of this style of spacer, because it is a unique Lord design, it introduces the discussion of damping versus dampening. So we want to remember that damping is targeted at decreasing the amplitude of some oscillation. While the terminology often gets mixed up where we say dampening, we want to remember that we are actually damping vibrations. And what that means is we're lowering our deflections over time, as shown in the curve on the top here. So these are a viscous damper design, meaning they use a special fluid, uh, which has the elastomeric casing around them, allowing for increased damping during high deflection load cases. So we're altering it to those specific applications 
where we control the engine motions, especially during startup and shutdown, isolating those frequencies and still allowing for superior isolation during normal operating speeds. And as you can see at the image of the bottom here with an LM damper installed between the two mounting halves, it almost has a balloon like elongated appearance where it's a little bit thicker and fuller than a typical spacer because it has that fluid within it. So now we're going to talk about the installation of our engine mounts. As I mentioned before, we have our two sandwich mounting halves and our spacer component in each kit. The next image here shows them in place with the bracket of the engine mount, which fits around the mounting halves themselves. The key is to get a pre-compressed mounting halves through your through bolt installation and torquing of the mounting halves. This allows for a pre-compressed mount as shown in our last image. So to achieve the, the proper compression of our engine mounts, as I was discussing previously, it's a combination of many factors. It's not just by torquing a bolt simply. So this is why we have our specialized designs which are tailored for each application. Uh, through the combination of the correct bolt size, the adequate selected stiffness of the individual sandwich mount components, the bracket thickness that the mounts are mounting to, and using the correct torque spec, we're able to achieve the adequate compression for each mounting set. This is often called out by the OEM or in the installation drawing. As you can see in the image to the right here, we use a 7 16 inch bolt, which is pretty standard for these style of mounts, with a recommended torque of about 450 to 500 inch pounds. So coming from this, we talk about why do we pre-compress mounts? What's the significance behind this? Well, we can think of our each mounting half as a spring, giving us a spring system. So with the two sandwich mounting halves shown here, we have K1 and K2, and when they're installed, we would have the bracket, which is rectangular shape in this image, in between K1 and K2, each with stiffness. So why do we pre-compress them? Well, we're installing the bolt through the mounts to tighten and pre-compress the mounts. Now, this gives us a bolt force, which is what is actually compressing on each mounting half, and the two mounts, in this case, would each have the same stiffness. As you can see below, they're modeled by K1 and K2. So the force in each part would be equal, and we would also have the same pre-compression deflection delta equal and opposite. So you can see we have force is equal to K times delta, the deflection from the mounts in the compression. When we have an external load F, which would be applied, it's going to cause there to be an unequal compression. So for instance, in this case, if F is to the left, we're going to have mount one compress more and mount two compress less. What that does is gives us a total force if we sum our forces. So we have F1 minus F2 and we get our resultant force acting on that center bracket between the two mounting halves. So we do some crazy math here. We substitute our values in for K times delta deflection. Uh, we cancel the like terms. And what we end up getting is that our total stiffness, KT, is equal to two times K from each of the sandwich mounting halves. So what this brings us to is, once again, backing up our reasoning for why it's so important to have that pre-compression. So, on the opposite side, what happens if we were to unload a mount? Well, keep in mind that stiffness is what controls the performance of the mounts and gives us isolation and controlled motion. So for instance, if we unloaded mount two, there's no longer any stiffness contribution to that system from that mount. So it takes our K total, so our total stiffness, which was originally equal to 2K, now down to just K total is equal to K. So with that, we're no longer getting the ideal performance for the system. Once again, telling us why we pre-compress both sandwich mounting components, because it is most important to get the ultimate performance out of our mounts. So we've been designing systems for many years and we've come up with a process when a customer comes with us for getting the key information necessary to design their system. To do this, we have many data sheets, depending on what kind of engine is used on the aircraft, where we get key information from customers. What this helps us to answer are the major questions we need to know when we're designing a system. Some of these deal with how many mounts we need, where the mounts are located on the aircraft, and what orientation they go in. What's the desired stiffness of the mounts so that we ensure we have the proper deflections and isolation for the system. 
Is there a certain kind of spacer we need? What kind of elastomer do we need in that system to get the correct stiffness and isolation? How big and what kind of load area do we need, the mounts need to have? What style of mounts are we gonna use for the system? And lastly, are there any environmental concerns? So is it gonna be a high temperature application or any fluid concerns for the system? So with that being said, everybody thinks of there being one perfect mounting system. Well, yes, we are able to you know, design a system for each application so it's specialized and it's targeted. However, it's always a give and take to get that perfect mounting system, so to speak. Uh, so there's gonna be some trade-offs associated with that. We might optimize certain components, which are the key design goals for that system, and others might not be as significant, so we can evaluate those last in our design process. Uh, so for instance, if we're trying to reduce vibration and shock, sometimes we can achieve this with specialized fluids and elastomer casings. If we're trying to control engine motions or control things like drift or sag of the mount, we might have to choose a stiffer elastomer that limits motion. If it needs to be a fail-safe component, we need to make sure that if the elastomer were to fail, that we would have interlocking metal components, making the parts also fireproof. It might need to be a lightweight system or simple, with few components, making it easier to maintain and install. Uh, lastly, we can focus on things like expense and the, the life of the mounts, making sure that they're, while they might not last forever, they're going to last for the adequate fatigue life that is required for that system. So lastly, to sum things up, when we're talking about all of our mounting components within the kit and all the factors to consider, we have to think about the size, the elastomer, the shape, the stiffness, not just static, but dynamic as well the damping that we'll achieve from that system, how the mounts are gonna attach within the aircraft and the airframe, the loads and stresses that the mounts might experience during flight, and the deflections that they could experience from those loading conditions. Last, and some might argue the most important, is considering what type of elastomer to choose for the application. Uh, this is what Lord is known for, our specialized elastomers, and we can target different areas to achieve the correct performance out of our mounts with the elastomeric material that's selected. We can tailor it to certain stiffnesses or damping. Uh, we can control things like elongation, drift and set of the mounts, the fatigue life, what type of fluid they're resistant to, different temperatures that they can function within, age stiffening characteristics, and lastly, elasticity of the mounts. And I just want to bring us, uh, to bring our attention to the image here. It's not a Lord mount if it doesn't say Lord on it. A lot of people ask us here at Lord if they have a Lord mount or not because they are so well known in the industry. And one key telltale sign is that each of our elastomeric components will be marked with Lord manufacturing on it. So when we're designing our system, we have to keep in mind our different loading modes. And this is how we're able to do some design magic, so to speak. So when we do that, we consider the different loading directions and modes. So we have shear, we have compression, where the mounts are being pushed on, and tension when we're, they're being pulled. So we're able to get different performance characteristics out of our elastomer within these different modes. And that's how we're able to choose one material that might perform differently in each of these modes. There's different mounting systems and orientations for our engine mounting systems themselves. Uh, some aircrafts may have bed mounted systems where the engine mounts are on the bottom with the engine above them. They can be semi-focalized where part of the mounts are directed towards a common point or they can be fully focalized where all the mounts are directed towards a common center of gravity point or what we call a focalization point. Next, we have rear-mounted engine mounts, which, as the name says, mount from the back. Once again, these can be semi-focalized, as shown in a top image, or they can be fully focalized, where you see that all mounts are directed towards that common focalization point. So next, I have some real-life images here showing the different types of mounting orientations. In the first one, we have a non-focalized system. You can see the white lines coming off of the engine mounts are straight horizontal lines. They'll never meet, indicating they're not angled or focalized. The next image, and the one after it as well, shows focalized engine mounts, where if you connected the white lines of the middle image, they would meet at that common focalization point 
indicating their angling and the orientation of the mounts. And then lastly, we have our diafocal fully focalized system. And now we're gonna take a break and pause for a quick poll question. This will be our first poll of the presentation. So moving on, we're gonna discuss some of the technology and design elements behind our engine mounts. Once again, elaborating on this focalization concept. Uh, when we have a focalized design system, there's one point called the focalization point that the mounts are pointing towards. Typically, we aim this to be a resultant combined center of gravity for the entire system, including the engine accessories, propeller, all of the main key elements of the system itself. What we aim to do with this is to split up the rotational and translational deflections, actually decoupling them. So you can see another example of a Lycoming piston engine system with focalized mounts down at the bottom here. So why do we focalize our systems? If we play the video here on the right, you'll see that the linear motion at the focalization point causes the engine to move at that center of gravity point. So this controls the motion at extreme locations of concern and allows for less motion at remote locations, allowing us to have controlled modes and ultimately our goal of increased vibration isolation. Uh, this is just one of our key tools that we use at Lord here, we made to demonstrate a focalized system. So this idea of isolation brings me to my next point of isolation versus transmissibility. This is a key design concept that comes into our mounting systems. So to talk about this, we have the effect of natural frequency. A natural frequency of the system when we're using engine mounts is defined by the stiffness of the mounts that are selected, the weight of the system, and the number of mounts that are being used. So we're able to calculate a natural frequency for that system based on those elements. And if we look at the image to the right here, we compare that as frequency increases of the system, transmissibility is going to change within that. And transmissibility indicates where our isolation occurs. Isolation occurs when transmissibility is lower than one. At that value, the transmissibility factor indicates what exact isolation we are getting within our system. So if we're at a transmissibility of 0 0.9, we're isolating by about 10%. One thing to keep in mind though, when we're talking about natural frequency is the balancing act that we have to juggle between natural frequency and deflections of our mounts. Typically, if you're trying to get a lower natural frequency of your system, we would try to select a softer part. However, the negative of this is that you will experience higher deflections. On the opposite side, if you choose a stiffer part, you might have higher natural frequencies, but you will achieve lower deflections of your system. So it's a constant balancing act in selecting a mount that optimizes the system and is the correct trade-off between those two factors. Talking about the stiffness of our mounts, often mounting kits include a combination of sandwich mounts. It might not both be the same stiffness. An example of this is our shin mounts, as shown on the left here. They use an extra piece of metal in between the mounts, which adds a stiffness factor to the mounts. What this means is they'll be stiffer in one position so that they can support the static weight of the engine. These are gonna be defined in the aircraft manual to make sure that you're installing the mounts correctly and in the right orientation. So going off of this, if we move to our next slide, you'll see that, as I mentioned, the shimmed portion, so the stiffer half of the mount, needs to be installed on the correct side of each mount location. We can always assume that under 1G loading, we want our shim portion to be on the side of the mount so that it is under compression. This will be shown in installation drawing, similar to the one shown here, or you can refer back to your OEM. Ultimately, we want to remember the math. What I mean by that is stiffness, like I said before, is what controls our isolation and motion of the system. So with that, isolation is what gives us the reliability of our engine mounts. So we have to keep in mind that because of the math that was explained earlier, if our kits aren't installed properly, if we're not ensuring the right compression and the right orientation of our mounts, they won't have the performance characteristics that we would predict them to have. So we could induce vibrations that move closer to the operating frequency of the system. 
or we could run into issues with the cow clearance, which could greatly decrease if we're not installing mounts properly. So with mount life and inspections, the common question of what the service life of the engine mounts may be. Well, we don't actually have a defined limit for service life of our mounts. Uh, this is because there's so many factors involved in making this determination. Things to consider are items like where the aircraft is stored. Is it stored in cold temperatures, hot temperatures? Is it in the weather? Is it covered? How often is the aircraft flown? Is it sitting for months at a time or is it flown every day? And what are those flight behaviors while it's flying? Is it doing aerobatic maneuvers with high G and applications or are they fairly regular flight patterns? Uh, these are things that contribute to how the mounts are gonna wear over time and how often they're gonna need replaced. So in order to check this sort of thing, since we don't have a set limit, we recommend conducting regular visual and dimensional inspections to ensure that your mounts are performing adequately and are not in need for replacement. Uh, we can do so using our Lord products for general aviation brochure, which can be found on our website. So going off of this, I'm gonna dig into the maintenance and inspections of our engine mounts. When we are inspecting our mounts, the first thing to look out for visually is what state the elastomeric material is in. First, we're gonna look for a loss of bond. Checking all adhesion points between the elastomeric material and any metal components. We want to make sure that the elastomer is still adhered to the metals and that it is no longer, that there aren't any cases where it's no longer stuck to the metals. Next, we're going to check for mechanical damage of the elastomer. These would be visible signs of cuts or pieces missing within the elastomer. And lastly, we're going to check for any signs of environmental damage which could show up in a gummy texture or swollen mounts that appear very hard or soft. And if we're looking at all three of these images, they would each indicate replacing the engine mounting kit. So next I'm gonna get into a quick video showing how we inspect the mounts for a loss of bond. If we play our video, what we're gonna see here is a shim feeler type gauge being used and insert it at any locations that appear where there could be a loss of metal to rubber bond. So as we're turning our mounting half around here, we see a spot where elastomer could be missing. We insert a feeler gauge in this area, and we wanna measure that distance that it can be inserted. If it's greater than three millimeters, we would recommend replacing the mounts. Next, we're gonna move to our second mounting half. This is a shim mounting half, so there is an extra piece of metal in between the elastomeric section. So we're looking for areas where there could be a loss of bond or elastomer missing. Here we see an area, we insert a feeler gauge once again, and we're gonna take that measurement. And we'll continue doing this to all elastomeric components to make sure there's no areas where this inserted distance is greater than three millimeters. So next, we already looked at our elastomeric visual inspection, so we're gonna do a metallic visual inspection of any of the metal parts on the engine mount. What we're gonna look for is any signs of mechanical damage. Is metal cracked? Are the plates deformed in any way or scratched, nicked, or gouged? So anything that could cause a performance variation or concern with the metals. Next, we're gonna check if there's any damage to the attachments. Are they missing any lockware or are there loose bolts or nuts? And as indicated here, in this case, we would replace the kit and recommend tightening all of the hardware and replacing the hardware that is missing. Lastly, we're gonna conduct a dimensional inspection. So what we're gonna look for is eccentricity, which is labeled as dimension A in the image to our left. And we're gonna check the thickness of the elastomeric section of the engine mounting halves. Uh, these values can be found in our engine mounting inspection brochure, as I mentioned previously, and the dimensions are each associated with the component numbers of the sandwich mounting halves. So before I get into my last discussion here, we're going to pause for our second poll question. So next up brings me to a key discussion that's often brought up by customers, and that is shelf life of the engine mounts versus the service life of the engine mounts. First, I'll talk about shelf life. This applies to the time period before the engine mounts are installed and have flight hours from being flown. This is when they're in their new condition in an original packaging sitting on the shelf, so to speak. So 
each part, which is rubber elastomeric part, would have an associated shelf life with it due to the aging properties of the elastomer as it sits over time. Uh, for black rubber, this is typically five years. And for our silicone or brown elastomeric parts, this is typically unlimited. However, each part number does have the specific uh, shelf life period, and we can certainly provide this information to you as it is requested. Once mounts are installed, however, we cross over to a service life. At this point, shelf life no longer applies, and we only want to consider how long the part will last once it's in being in use. Uh, this is where we start our visual and dimensional inspections of the parts and we remove them per the maintenance manual and check for unusual damage or conditions that would designate replacement of the mounts. So finally, some last considerations to make. First, I'll talk about preventative care of the engine mounts. So these are elastomeric components and we wanna be sure that we're keeping them clean and shielded from different exposure. You wanna shield them from heat, you want to protect them from any fluids they could be exposed to and clean them if they are ever exposed to such things. Yes, it is important to cover your engine mounts while you're cleaning the engine because those fluids can influence the life of the mounts. And you'll also want to inspect and check them often to ensure they haven't ex received any of this exposure. Remember to always change your engine mounts with every engine overhaul. Uh, these will be defined per the AMM or CMM. Always change the full kit. This is a big one. I'm often asked if we can have a customer just replace one sandwich mounting half or just both sandwich mounting halves and reuse a spacer. Well, the key thing to note here is typically you're purchasing a whole kit anyway, so we always recommend replacing all the kit components because they do play into the performance of the mounts and we want to make sure that they're all at the same age and time frame and that they're aging at the same rate. Remember, don't flip or rotate your mounts. This is a big one. As I said before, typically mounting kits have a specific orientation as it is. So we don't wanna flip or rotate the mounts, which could cause performance limitations. So now we're gonna go into our large shimmy dampers, talking about the design of them and comparing them to other hydraulic shimmy dampers. So I think we all can compare shimmying to a common analogy here. Uh, what about when you go to the grocery store and you get your shopping cart and you just happen to get a wheel that's excessively oscillating back and forth, making it difficult to move the cart within the store? Well, the same thing happens to nose landing gear on aircrafts. It's a vibration that is initiated by various landing conditions, depending on the situation. And ultimately it causes that landing gear to oscillate back and forth. If we go to the next slide, we'll see in a video here an aircraft landing where it experiences this extreme shimmy. So the question is what causes this nose wheel shimmy to occur? Well, it can be caused by a lot of different factors. Uh, first, it could be caused by factors unrelated to the shimmy damper. So these would be physical things such as the runways not being smooth, uh, landing gears and wheels being unbalanced or the tires having imperfection on, on the nose landing gear. The nose wheel could also have connecting links which could be loose. If it's a damper issue, if you're using a hydraulic shimmy damper, there could be leaks in the fluid causing them to need rebuilt or replaced, or the connections on the damper itself could not be tight. So with this, we'll talk about the Lord shimmy damper design. Our design is rather simple, however, there is quite a bit of design and methodology that goes into coming up with a system such as this. It's a highly specialized elastomer, which allows us to have this design. So our shimmy dampers use three main parts. We have our elastomeric piston. We have our lubricant, which is bordering against the elastomer and the image to my right. And lastly, we have our housing, which encases the entire shimmy damper unit. So how this works is instead of using a hydraulic fluid, we use our elastomer to lubricant friction that occurs between the two in order to dissipate the shimmy energy that's occurring and dampen the system. What this means is no fluid is involved at all because we're replacing what would be accomplished by the hydraulic fluid 
with our idea of friction. So it now becomes a fluid free solution. So going off of that, to compare um, a standard hydraulic shimmy damper, which may, you may be familiar with, to our Lord fluid free damper, uh, the first thing I'd like to note, which is the most obvious, is it does not use fluid. Therefore, there's no chance for any fluid leaks. Uh, with hydraulic dampers, this becomes an issue over time and can often uh, require maintenance with the hydraulic dampers, whereas being ours require no fluid, they're actually a maintenance-free solution. The lower dampers are also shown to absorb more energy uh, than some of their hydraulic comparative parts. They're a bit more consistent in high and low temperatures, whereas the hydraulic fluid can become a bit sluggish in low temperatures. Our large shimmy dampers require very few components and installation bracketry and hardware, and thus they can install fairly quickly and last for 10 plus or more years. Some people say they last the life of the, the aircraft, and you're not taking them on and off, being they don't require any maintenance. And at this time, we'll launch our third and final poll question. So next we'll show a quick video um, of the Lewis University Flight School discussing their use of Lord shimmy dampers on their fleet aircraft. Our oldest dampener is 12 years. That's a Lord, and we haven't had to replace it yet. That's about 8,000 hours on it now. As they get older, we don't even bother replacing it with the original. We change it to the Lord because it's easier, less maintenance. With the Lord, it's pretty simple. It's pretty much, is it on there? It's tight, we're good, let's go. And lastly, I just wanted to highlight the comparison of the ac actual effectiveness of the Lord shimmy damper. So the area within the blue uh, curves or loops here is the energy that's dissipated. As you can see, the Lord shimmy damper energy it covers a, lot, a much larger area than the, tip, the standard hydraulic damper, and it's a lot more reliable. So that sums things up for my presentation. As I mentioned before, I handle our aerospace technical support requests. We have a number and an email that you can contact us with, with any technical questions you may have, and I look forward to hearing from you. And at this time, we're gonna open it up to any questions you may have.